Good afternoon, everyone. This is, of course, the sleepy time of the day after lunch. But I was assured that uh, since our panelists are the most exciting of the lot of speakers, that we're going to keep everyone awake. But uh, I might turn to you from time to time and suddenly ask you what you last heard. So <laughs> stay awake. Um, I'll start with a note of uh, uh, commiseration for uh, our colleague, the very well-known Bangladeshi photographer Shahidul Alam, whose large shoes I am uh, not trying to fill, but uh, he was supposed to be actually here moderating this panel, and many of you will be familiar with his work. Uh, because he has been a stalwart uh, activist, uh, using both his craft and uh, his personal space to forward issues of justice in Bangladesh. He is currently in jail. Uh, today is the 61st day that he has been in jail uh, without being granted bail uh, because he spoke out against what the government was doing to protesting students. And uh, he has been uh, arrested under a particularly restrictive act called the Inter called, um, Internet Communication Act, ICT Act. Uh, which restricts uh, what journalists and others can do. And you can be arrested on the flimsiest ground and then denied bail. And the government plans to further strengthen it. So I think just like our last panel was saying, uh, there are increasing challenges. And it's really interesting to be part of this. I thank the organizers for inviting me to this. It's an important moment in time for all of us to be talking about these challenges. and. Uh, we have very interesting uh, speakers on our panel. So I think what uh, we can do with this session, uh, the last session laid out a lot of broad themes. But now we have people who are practitioners on the ground. So it's a kind of could be a, a panel to test how these uh, theories, challenges operate from people who've been working on the ground and how they see the issues which we which were being discussed uh, earlier in the morning. Uh, I'll keep the introductions very brief, uh, but of course you will hear more about them and their work as we go along. Um, I'll start by introducing uh, Hannah Mackay. Uh, she's a Reuters photographer based in uh, London, uh, but has done some stellar work in uh, uh, photographing the Rohingya, for which her photograph won the Pulitzer Prize for Reuters earlier this year. Um, we have uh, Patrick Brown, an award-winning photographer as well, who's worked a lot in Africa and Asia, and also whose photograph on the Rohingya refugees uh, uh, got an award, apart from many, many awards he has got, which uh, I will not list. Um, and uh, we have uh, Matthew Smith from Fortify Rights who has been working since uh, 2005 in this region. And uh, in, on Myanmar, he's been working since there, uh, on Myanmar since 2005 and set up 45 rights in 2013, which is looking at Myanmar, Thailand, Bangladesh, and Malaysia. Uh, and we have Minza O. Would he be, could he, we get him in the, while I introduce him? So Minzia Rao uh, uh, started, I think, as a medical uh, student and became a photographer. He worked with Reuters, but now is an independent photographer. Hello, Minzia. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. Good to have you here uh, uh, digitally, if not in person. And I hope you'll be able to participate uh, for the fullest extent in this uh, panel. Yeah, I'm also sorry that I couldn't make it, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I could join somehow. <laughs> I think you need to adjust your laptop screen. We're only getting your forehead. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm not seeing my... Uh... The first position oh, was I, good. Oh, all right, good, yeah. Uh, while you adjust that, uh, I was uh, just introducing you. So yeah. uh, since I didn't have a chance to talk, I went online. Um, you need to move a little bit more to get your face on screen. OK. 
Oh, I, I think the problem is at our end. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, Minzer, I read somewhere that you actually uh, sold a piano to become a photographer. Is that a myth or is that a reality? Yeah, that's actually a reality because when I when I started in 2010, like when I first picked up a camera, I, I was still studying medicine, and my parents were not approving that I was going to become a, I was going to try photography. So I, I sold my piano and then bought my first camera. So, so sorry. Uh, uh, Minzia, if you can zoom out of your laptop, I think that is, you're too close to it, perhaps. Um, no, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, we'll uh, move on while this gets uh, sorted out. Hopefully, on, on my uh, screen it shows that I'm 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 right in the center of the screen. But <laughs> do you think if you ex <laughs> <laughs> okay, while we wait for Min uh, to be dialed in again, um, I'll start by asking uh, Hannah. Um, you joined the Reuters and presumably received all their training. But uh, in a very short space of time, you had to go and report on the Rohingya crisis. Yeah, should be ah, like Minza, that's great. Now we have you right in center. So I'm just starting with uh, asking Hana a question. And uh, perhaps after that, we'll move to you. Um, so, Hannah, how was the transition from what you learned, let's say, in the training course, to what you actually faced in terms of ethical issues on the ground? Um, hello, everybody. Um, so, yeah, so I joined Reuters, and they put you through a hostile environment course, which is like a five-day course about um, preparing yourself for hostile environments. Um, and it covers a wide range of situations. Um, all that is... I'm not used to working in the UK. Um, and about two weeks after the course finished, um, I was sent to Bangladesh to cover the Rohingya crisis. Um, and it was a very, very different way of working. Um, I'd say in the UK, um, there's a negativity around photographers and, and cameras, um, whereas I felt more in Bangladesh, um, people welcomed you taking their picture. and. It, you, obviously, there's a language barrier there, but the, the camera is a universal symbol, and it's, if people don't want their picture taken, then then they'll tell you. But actually, nine times out of ten, I found that everybody welcomed you as a photographer, and whether or not they knew uh, the outcome of of taking those photos or what, but it, it's almost like they saw that as a universal symbol of hope that I was there to be able to tell their story. Um, but I did find some situations challenging. Could we show the picture? Uh, this picture that we're about to um, look at is a situation that um, I was in, and it was physically demanding, but it was also uh, morally challenging. Um, this lady, there was a, a a crossing from my mind to Bangladesh, and this was at the River Naf, um, and there was thousands of uh, refugees making their way through, um, and this lady couldn't get up the riverbank. Um, she was absolutely exhausted, and she was really trying to pull herself up to carry on with the journey, um, and she just had nothing left in her to give. So. As I was with three other photographers, and we were sat at the top of the riverbank, um, and the of the refugees were trying to help her, but we could see that that they, she needed help from other people. So we intervened, and so um, pulled her up and and got her to safety. Um, and it was a real moment of separating your head and your heart, and. Um, at the time, this picture got a lot of coverage, and I think it was probably because you can see the the white 
hand in the frame. So it, it gives a sense of um, two worlds colliding. And um, it was really, it was a difficult moment, but y you're in, it was a break in news situation where the urogenin is running and it takes over. And it's only afterwards when you sit back and think about actually what happened in that situation. But um, there was a few situations like this where um, you have to put your camera down and help. And so obviously I didn't at this particular moment because we wouldn't have got the picture, but um, I did put the camera down afterwards and, and helped pull her onto the bank. And I think um, it's important to remember that what goes on before and after a picture is taken. It's very easy to blame a photographer for um, taking a, an image without caring about the subject when actually situations like this did arise and we did stop to make sure that we were all human at the end of the day. So we stopped to help the people in the picture. But then you also have to remember that you've got a job to do and you've got a responsibility as a photographer to the, to the subject, to the story, um, and to the world, really, to show everybody what's going on there. So, um, yeah. I think we'll come back to some of the other mm -hmm. challenges that you, you were talking about uh, later in the discussion. But if I can go to Minzao while we have him. Uh, Minzao, uh, could you t talk to us a little bit about the moment that you decided you wanted to be a photographer and uh, you were saying that... Uh, your parents didn't like it. And Hannah has been just talking about how she felt uh, photographers were seen as a symbol of hope, uh, unlike in the UK, uh, in the camps where she was photographing. Um, what is the reception or receptivity to photographers in Myanmar? And that also must have changed in the years that you've been doing this work. <coughs> Yeah. Um, so when I started, I, rem I, I, rem I remember I, w I just started to take, you know, photos of uh, landscapes and of the cities and nature because before, as far as I remember, before 2010-11, it wasn't possible to uh, really be a photojournalist because it's, it's, it was even risky to walk uh, around town taking pictures of the street. Um, but then... I uh, after when uh, Dong San Suu Kyi like got released from house arrest, and 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 then they were gonna enter the by-election. They started the camp uh, campaigns for the by-election in the country, and many young people, including me, like thought you know this this was gonna be historic, and we wanted to try and follow and photograph um, the campaign. So I also joined um, uh, this group of people like you know following the campaign and photographing and it, it was a time I remember it was very it was very hopeful and you know we, we were witnessing something that we've never seen in a in a long time and and then in after 2000 so after 2012 that was when many um, young you know generation of uh, journalists and photographers uh, started to work with the transition of the country yeah and do you think uh, people in Myanmar see a g role for the photographer? Or how do people receive you when you go with the camera? Um, back then, uh, it was it was very it was very um, much easier, like walking on the you know on the streets and taking pictures. Uh, people were still like you know very friendly, and because you know b before that we didn't have many. Uh, uh, journalists and media coverage so that was also the first time for everybody you know to, to see like people photographing on the streets and uh, I, I, I thought it was it was still very welcoming but as um, over the years you know as more issues escalated you know and, and there was there, there's more and more um, mistrust towards the media nowadays um, yeah especially you know after this Rohingya crisis and yeah Thanks, Unzo. Um I'll now come to Patrick, perhaps. Um, Patrick, you are much younger than you look. Uh, but <laughs> Be careful. Be careful. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that came out quite the wrong way. Um, 
I want, what I really wanted to say was uh, that the issues of ethics of representation were not being discussed uh, until very recently. And then I wanted to pay you a compliment by saying that maybe the ethics of representation were uh, just started to be discussed when you entered uh, photojournalism, and then it came out all wrong. I apologize. Um, but um, you um, were also talking about how uh, you have a lot of concern uh, when you take photographs about which ones you pick for representation. And I'm wondering how that uh, relationship with the ethics of what you're photographing has evolved for you. First of all, I'm 49. Okay, can we? I will be turning 50 in January, so any, any gifts I'll take them lightly. Um, uh, in my defence, I'm older, <laughs> but you look much younger. <laughs> um, it's it's really difficult. This uh, this discussion comes up quite a lot. Um, every incident or every when it becomes quite sensitive the there's a whole new template you're going into a structure you're going into a whole society that you're some somewhat approaching it from a remote perspective maybe i should rewind a little bit when i take photographs when i go to a country i don't do research in the sense of visual literacy i do research on data, population, disease, all those, the data. I try not to taint myself with other people's perception of that country or that place, uh, either a national or an, an international person. I want to see it through the naivety of my own existence in that position. So I take that naivety, but somewhat the perspective that is coming from a human instinct. These people, especially the images that are up there now, um, <coughs> are, are, are very difficult to take. It's it's not something that you take very lightly. You 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 literally are walking around dead people, and you have to navigate that as if it's. I don't want to use the word in in any disrespect but a light dance you're dealing with people's emotions and and many spectrums and you have to navigate the emotions as well as your own emotions you need to put them aside because there's nothing more condescending as a photographer or documentation somebody working in the documentation world is if you were to break down i mean that's you're there to do a purpose. Yes, it doesn't mean the image doesn't affect me. It doesn't mean that the situation doesn't affect me. I'm not discarding that at all. But at the situation of the time, you, you really need to have a balance between the aesthetics and the message and almost the, the human voice within your own chest. As you can see for the, the next couple of images, the, I took a wide picture and then I took a medium picture, and then I took a tight picture. Um, could you move forward one, one slide, please? Yeah. So this is the image that was, that was publicized, was published. I, it wasn't, you know, there was a bit of distance, there's a bit of context to it all, and that's what the editors thought was the image. It wasn't until I went back over the images a couple of days later that I decided it was another image. And if you could go to that slide now, that'd be great. So, ironically, that one had never been published before until the World Press picked it up. Now, ethics. It doesn't, even to this day, it doesn't sit well on my shoulders that I won an award for this image. But this image isn't about me. It never was about me. It was the World Press. The judges who are visually literate, in incredibly articulately uh, placed politically, and they thought that this image was the best image to portray the Rohingya crisis. Because how do you photograph something that you cannot photograph? And there's no photographers allowed into Northern Rakhine State. So everything was past tense. 
but this was a this was a position of presence. These were a death, a preventable death. And they are as just as much victim on the Bangladesh side of the border as they are on the Burmese side. Getting back to your ethics, I think it boils down to the individual. I I don't see myself as a photographer. I see myself as somebody that takes pictures. And before that, I'm a, I, I think I'm a person that looks a little bit older than they should. But uh, I'm a person. And I think it comes down to the personality of the individual, not the discipline of photography. We keep putting the photography on the chopping block here. It's the individual that's doing the documentation, not photography. Was it? Yeah, I, I think that was my answer. I think there are lots of issues to unpack in that, and we will, as uh, we discuss further things. But if I can come to you, Matthew. Um, Patrick was, young Patrick was just mentioning uh, about uh, the purpose of as a photographer. Uh, now, in Fortify Rights, unlike uh, all the other three who have spoken earlier, um, I think it's much more about advocacy. Um, what kind of a shift does uh, that make to how you see the use of photography? That's a great question. Uh, for us, there's a overriding evidentiary value um, that we bring uh, to the work when we're assessing, um, for example, what video to use or what images to use. Um, there are three, um, and, and I think actually from our perspective as a human rights organization, ethics uh, permeate everything that we do, um, perhaps to a fault in, in some situations, but um, Fortify Rights, there are three basic components to our work. We're doing in-depth investigations, so we're getting as close as possible to where human rights violations are taking place. We're documenting, doing in-depth investigations. Um, the second part is we're doing engagement. So we're, we're um, uh, identifying people in positions of power who can change negative outcomes to positive outcomes. Um, the third part of our work, which in some ways I think differentiates Fortify Rights a bit from some other organizations, is we uh, provide support to um, activists, human rights defenders, directly affected communities. So that comes in the form of workshops, trainings, um, facilitating access to people in power for people who otherwise wouldn't have that access. Uh, and this is a big part of our organization's work. Um, it's also the least publicized aspect of it. But in all of those different things, there's there are ethical considerations, particularly with regard to the use of visual media. Um, and so I think uh, um, that certainly factors into it. And you know, we have policies and, and we have internal guidelines that help us decide, uh, make decisions, as I'm sure other organizations do as well. Um, but I think in terms of um, you know, what the decisions that are made, um, if we know certain crimes are being perpetrated and we've conducted those investigations and we're confident of it, um, there, there are certain types of media that will help make that case. So for example, if we're trying to hold a perpetrator accountable or advocating for an international court to, to, to uh, uh, get jurisdiction or what have you, um, visual media is extremely important. We've had, I was talking earlier, we've had some cases where you know, we, could, we could document at length in, in written form um, human rights violations and certain government officials will just dismiss it every time. Um, there was an instance a year or so ago where we released some short footage of military officers committing torture. Uh, and this immediately elicited a response from the authorities and from the Myanmar military. Um, and so uh, I think there's some important lessons to be learned there about evidentiary thresholds uh, in terms of getting governments to change bad behavior to, to better behavior. Uh, you're talking about the evidentiary nature of the work that you do. And uh, the Rohingya crisis, of course, has been one where uh, journalists, um, activists, um, and I'd like to address this to all three of you, perhaps, uh, 
and but especially photographers have not just been witnessed but what they witnessed and documented has played a large role in actually uh, enabling people to investigate uh, these crimes and yet i think uh, you are all also covering an area where access is extremely restricted uh, that's quite an interesting duality uh, Patrick, would you like to speak a little bit to that? Restricted realities. I mean, that's that's the nature of the beast in the type of work that I do. Um, I will. The Rohingya crisis for me, I've I've steered clear of it. I've I've more focused my Burma work on the eastern borders. So the Kachin, the Shan, and Cayenne, it, it's been my, and the Mon, of course, have been my main focus. And I sort of stayed clear of the Rohingya uh, crisis because it's, it's very difficult. It doesn't mean it's not so hard on the eastern border, but it's a very difficult one to get into because it opens up a large area. So we have to remember that this crisis we're talking about is a contemporary crisis. It's been going on repeatedly, 72, 75, 80s, and then in the 90s. And I thought that I'd sort of come late to that, and I stayed clear of it. But also, selfishly, I also stayed clear of it because I realized it was incredibly difficult to document. You really want to get to the nature of it, you need to get into Sitwe, and then move out of Sitwe and up into the hills, which is almost impossible if you um, look like me so it so selfishly I stayed away from it and it sort of opened up for me not intentionally um, I, it just uh, it, it opened up when it, the borders sort of opened up to some some degree and I for the first time I, I was hearing stories um, from individuals that would make your blood run cold and it it made me more driven than I've ever been to tell their story because I realized how isolated I have been and I think I'm fairly informed about Burma. I had suddenly seen the western border as an incredibly diverse, difficult subject matter to document and that to me is is one of the reasons I do what I do is because it's a story that needs and must be told. And uh, our missing colleague Shahidul Alam is someone, of course, who's done uh, stellar work on documenting the Rohingya crisis from Bangladesh, which has become the place from which a lot of people are working uh, to document this. Uh, you were talking just now about uh, the trauma in uh, witnessing and documenting some of these issues. And I'm wondering if this is a good time to talk about some of that. But perhaps I'd like to go to you, Hannah, now. And since this was one of your first experiences uh, in a situation like this, uh, what was the emotional response that you had? And how did you deal with it, both individually and were you even offered some kind of practical help? Uh, when you return from the field? Yeah, so um, I was there for nearly three weeks and the first half of the trip was, um, I was almost eased into the story because um, it was daily life in the camps and it was um, going around and listening to stories of the refugees and, um, and documenting their life now they're s settling into Bangladesh. Um, and then the the picture that uh, we looked at earlier of the lady being pulled out of the uh, mud, that was a, a situation that arose as a breaking news uh, situation and up to 5,000 refugees were crossing the border. Um, and this was, this was the moment where I realized um, the severity of the story. Um, I was there until, until sundown and so you realize then that the lights go out and they're, they're still there and they're, they sit at the river overnight while you go back to your hotel and freshen up and get a good night's sleep. 
Um, so you do carry some guilt with that because as a human you want to help them. Um, so I was faced with situations like this. There was also situations with um, people who had died and, and photographing um, dead people, which isn't something that's ever happened before. And um, that was quite eye-opening as well. So it, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, how did you actually uh, come to terms with oh, this? Yes. And were you actually offered any kind of yeah, so counseling and the practical aspect of what I, you've been through, you'll probably go through again, and what a lot of uh, journalists, students in this room will face in the future? Yeah. Is there a practical component to dealing with this kind of an issue? I mean, I think everybody's different, and people deal with uh, situations differently. Um, Whilst I was there, I was almost in a in a work bubble, and you're able to um, hide behind the camera almost. And so, once I returned, um, I had a conversation um, with one of my bosses, who sat me down and said, "Are you okay? Do you need anything?" And there's this and this in place. So Reuters is very good f for making sure um, out of the field afterwards there's a support ne network for you. Um, fortunately, I haven't haven't had to use it and um, I always feel like I would like to go back and I, I hope that door is open because I feel like the story is still ongoing and as a photographer and a person who's been there I would like to return to be able to continue that work. Uh, Minzia, if I can ask you at this point uh, I think uh, all our other three panelists are those who visit the places that they're documenting and they do have the option of leaving. Uh, but you are uh, bearing witness in a place which is also your own country. Uh, that uh, must be so much uh, harder. And I'm also assuming that uh, support systems for what you're doing, whether within your peer group or through some other forms of support, uh, must be very rudimentary if they exist at all. Can you talk to us about this aspect? Uh, we can't hear you. One second, Minzia, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I, OK. Um, yeah, it was, nowadays it's surely a very difficult subject to report on here, especially when you're in Myanmar. But um, if I if I can go through a bit of my coverage from from the beginning, and um, there was I remember there was like 2012 June uh, when that was when it first happened. Um, I, there was a there, there was a story of a a, a Rakhine girl who was raped and murdered, and then there was this photo, the graphic photo of the body of the the girl surfaced on Facebook. And many uh, people were furious, and because the rumor was that it, it, you know they, she was raped, ra raped and killed by um, by the Bur Burmese, uh, sorry, the, by the Muslims, um, which was not confirmed. Um, and then in response, there was um, like a few days later, a mob stopped a bus uh, and killed uh, ten Muslim men who were traveling on it, and that was how the violence really started. And you know, back then I remember media access was much, still much better. Like many, even though it wasn't open yet for foreigners to go, like many local journalists could go uh, even to the front line and cover the very crisis. I couldn't, um, I, I couldn't go back then because I, I, I just started working with Reuters and I haven't completed my um, hostile enrollment management training. Uh, but my my other friends and colleague went there. The initial story was that. Um, you know, the, these range of Muslims were like uh, burning their own houses and then, um, kill, you know, like uh, harming, attacking the Rakhine villages. Uh, but but then, like, as more media got um, reports and access, I remember a friend of mine, uh, especially a friend of mine, took a really great picture of this Rakhine, young Rakhine man walking back, uh, walking with a weapons in in his hand and then you know and then another colleague like interviewed him as uh, in the in the back background of 
him is like burning a Muslim village. And another colleague interviewed him and he said, oh yeah, we just came out, uh, we just burned the Muslim village uh, back there. So that was when, you know, the, the perspective of the people change and then start to realize, oh, there's a really uh, communal violence happening between the two. And and then uh, after June violence in 2012, um, October, I, I that was the first time I could go uh, to cover the crisis myself, and I, I went with another colleague, and we were doing a report on on the on the aftermath. So I went to a town called Chakpu. It's it's in the southern part of Rakhine State. Uh, let me run through some photos from there. Sorry. Yeah, um, so this this is uh, Chao Piu, uh, and I, I, I there, so there was a whole village, a uh, Muslim village, uh, which was burned during the conflict, um, and 891 houses uh, were destroyed. Uh, almost all of the Muslims from the town uh, disp got displaced. Um, and. This is um, a, a, a letter that a word that says like Rakhine Buddhist home um, and hang with a picture of a pagoda. This is from the aftermath. And um, so after after that violence, um, the, so the the 2012 violence left um, like almost 200 killed and then displaced uh, 140,000 people who were now living in the camps and, you know, still stuck in these camps in situ. Um, so, and then the, the, back then the violence was still very much um, an anti-Muslim form and it, and then it spread it uh, to other parts of the country, like in, in, to Megtila or to, or to Shan State or to other places. Um, in 2014, I, I went to cover the health crisis uh, in the camps in situ because the government expelled uh, major aid groups that were like um, giving treatment to the to the uh, giving support to the Rohingya um, and the, the, some mobs attacked the NGO offices that's why this is pictures from the from the health crisis in 2014 and people were like uh, rely because some clinics that were operating in the camps were not operating anymore so people were depending on the makeshift clinics, and most of the clinics don't have proper medicines and like expired me medicines like this one here. And in 2014, November, I, I, I had a rare access to go to Mongdo. Uh, and I think it was quite an important trip because, you know, when people like, especially nationalists here talk about this issue, they always point at Mongdo as saying like there's uh, all these Mongdo is the northern Rakhine state, and uh, you know, in, in Mongdo there's so many uh, Muslims, but not very few Rakhine, Rakhine Buddhists. So out of like five five hundred and ten thousand people, only like thirty thousand are Rakhine or non-Muslims. So we uh, we got a rare access to go and for the uh, report there on how the Rakhines were besieged by the Muslims, but of course they had like uh, always. Uh, support and protection from the authorities. So this is b before all this violence happened in 2017. And this is a school um, for the, it's a government school where the Rohingya Muslim kids attend. And I met this, uh, this school teacher who was teaching them. And that time I remember many Rohingya Muslims were trying to leave the country for Malaysia and Thailand by boat. And this teacher was saying like he would rather remain here and teach at the school rather than leaving. And this is a picture of a Rakhine, <coughs> Rakhine uh, boy uh, who was like using internet with a Bangladeshi cell. And in 2015, I did a story on, um, on the Skype, uh, so, sorry, on, on how like 
people were using an internet hut in the camps and Sitway to communicate to those who were leaving by boat uh, for Malaysia and Thailand and got like kidnapped by human traffickers uh, at the border. And then in 2017, last year, I, uh, I went to photograph the crisis. Because that time already, it's, uh, it's very difficult to go to Rakhine State, not even uh, to Mongdo, but even to go to the camps. It was very difficult, uh, almost no access. So I, I, I tried to go to Bangladesh. I was on assignment, uh, and I, I went to photograph Exodus. I, I could only photograph for about a day before getting... Uh, detained uh, because I went in with a tourist visa. Uh, sorry, I, I, I ran through a lot of photos. Thanks yeah. for that, Minzia. That gives us a really a good overview of what has been happening over a period of time. Yeah. Um, I'd like to use that as a departure point to get to some of the issues which were being discussed uh, earlier in the morning. Um, and perhaps, uh, Matthew, I'll start with you. The issue of consent. Uh, we've seen some very compelling pictures uh, from all the three photographers. And the issue of uh, getting consent from the people you're photographing. Um, I'm wondering if you can uh, start off the discussion on this about what you think about how consent is and can be practiced. Yeah, it's a great question. It's obviously really important, particularly when you're documenting uh, human rights violations and there are security concerns. Um, for us, we're quite strict on consent. Um, you know, there has it has to be free, prior informed. Um, very important questions which you had raised earlier about you know the extent to which uh, you can establish uh, meaningful consent um, with uh, an individual who you know uh, may not have access to all the resources that everybody in this room has access to. Um, but we have seen some, um, uh, you know, I've personally in documenting human rights violations in this case or, you know, in working with members of the news media, we've, we have seen some quite um, concerning behavior. Um, and, and I think to David's point this morning that, you know, in, 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 in analyzing the bad behavior, it helps point us toward the direction of the better behavior. Uh, and I'll give you an example, like, you know, uh, a film crew comes in and, uh, and it's a Rohingya refugee um, uh, who, uh, who they want to speak to. And that person gets mic'd up, you know, and he's kind of uncomfortable what's going on here. And then they're getting cameras set up and somebody's getting set, you know, they're sitting down and they're speaking a language that that person doesn't understand. Um, and then they go through the process of getting consent. And at that point, it's already coercive because uh, there, there's a power dynamic there uh, where the person from the community is now faced with a litany of foreigners in front of them, expensive hardware and equipment in their face, and they're already wearing a microphone. Um, and so the, the extent to which this type of behavior is, is, um, is common um, is, is really, really disturbing. So I think there has to be an industry-wide um, uh, reckoning with that. Um, and, it, and it can lead to problematic situations because there are people who would be very willing to speak to participate in the truth-telling process, um, but they might not want their identity revealed. And so with our, all of our reporting, for the most, most, most of the time, um, at least with the written material, uh, we will change people's names. It's very clear in our methodology, and that's usually for security purposes. That said, uh, there are a lot of people who, you know, they're, they're, they are, uh, you know, ag ag aggressively engaging in truth telling, and they want their stories told, and they, you know, and, and I think there are there are plenty of those examples as well. Um, but I think, you know, make it's an it's a case by case basis certainly. But I think consent is absolutely important um, uh, for the most part, just to just to prevent any sort of unwanted security problems. 
Uh, Patrick, if I can come to you on this issue, uh, you know, as uh, Matthew was saying, uh, what does real consent mean? Uh, you're working in situations where people come from perhaps very different backgrounds. They may not have the tools to understand uh, even what you're doing with their photographs. Uh, so what does constitute consent? Uh, is it just someone nodding and saying, yeah, OK, I don't really understand what you're doing? Or do you actually take time to explain to them? And even so, can they understand where your photograph is finally going to end up? So how I normally operate, um, and my colleagues that are doing the writing, is that we usually work in two different situations. Is I usually like the writer do their thing, and I do my thing afterwards or before. And it's a very a cooperative situation. I might meet somebody that I feel that the writer should meet and vice versa. So it's just set that particular political scope, um, disarm it in some way. Um, when it comes to photographing people, I, I ask them four to five different ways. Because um, again, the power dynamic that Matt just mentioned is particularly in Southeast Asia, They uh, most people don't like to say no. So you need to word it in different ways and, and come from it from multiple angles. And one of the things that I always say to them, I'll be just as happy if you say no as if you'll say yes. It doesn't make any difference to me. It, it's, it's about you. So try and use that. If, um, if there's anything I can offer anybody, use multiple ways to ask the same question. And also do that methodology when you're asking questions about the, the thought they're talking about to try and find timelines and get the details right so that's how i ask it um could you possibly bring up the picture the portrait of uh of um her name is regima it's uh, just the, the vertical it's the third from the yeah that one uh, would you ask these questions before or after taking the well, This is where I'm going to come to the latter, that particular question. Um, Rajima really got to me. Um, she's, of all my career, I've kept these dams and blockages in place where I don't allow people in. And, you, and I don't mean that, and I really, I don't mean I'm being honest with you. You, you need to set up some firewalls. And I, I, again, wrong terminology, but you need to set up some things because you're dealing with situations that are, are not your environment. And the one of the things that I was taught by such people like uh, Matthew and other human rights watch lawyers and, and activists was, is try to stay away from the emotions of when you're questioning somebody. And when you're asking questions, stay to the details. What was the insignia that the soldiers, what color uniform, what was the hats, what they were wearing, what would, did the weapons look like? Steer away from the emotions because that's, try to keep things on a factual basis. One, it protects the individual that you're interviewing because you don't want to take them back emotionally to that place because they're already vulnerable. And two, you also need to, put, you need to keep the emotions out of it for factual information. Regima got through me. I, I've seen this lady now 20, 30 times. Um, and she, she's, uh, she's 20 years old. And she, she had a three-year-old child put from her arms and stomped on and the, the skull was crushed and then he was thrown on a fire and burnt alive. And then, he, then the soldiers collected her with a bunch of other ladies and put her in a house and, multiple, and raped her multiple times. And she escaped through a hole in the back. And no other woman came out of that fire, as she says. Now, I was shocked when she was telling me, and I could see my translator was really taken back about how to translate that into, for me. Because they were also, you also, also think about your translator fixer. I mean, when most of us are not trained in dealing with that, that type of information. It comes with years of experience. And so on that information, these pictures, were I withheld them for 
It was shot in November and they didn't get published until I think April. And all the women from this series of portraits I did on Tuli Tuli Massacre, I, I repeatedly went back and I saw them. And it was, these pic pictures of Rajima are already public and a lot of the portraits were, but this was for me. I needed to know that I was doing the right thing by her. And I, I asked her, I said, do you know when you mean, when I mean the world will know about your, this event? When she's pregnant again, and I, th I think the baby is due now. So when her child is maybe five or six years old, maybe older, will Google her name, do you know what will come up? And this was such an arrogant Western's perspective of a situation. I was coming with my own values. And she looked at me, she said, Patrick, I am illiterate, but I'm not dumb. I know there's a world out there. And, and that this needs to be told. And I did nothing wrong. They did wrong. Why should I hide? Now, I dealt with that for, for a little while, and I talked to a lot of people who were very close to me about it. And would I treat her any differently if she, this was a court case in Birmingham, London, New York? Would I photograph her any differently? If there was somebody who would have the same situation, all the same um, set of events that had happened to her, would I still photograph her? And she was still willing to be identified. Yes, I would. How, how should I, why should I not let her have the right to tell the world? And that's, I feel like I was doing the right thing. I've met her many times, I've talked to her, and she's, she understands what the internet is. She understands that people will know about this, and she is not ashamed of it. She obviously, is, it, it's affected her beyond belief, but she did nothing wrong. I know that I did everything in my power to make sure that I was doing the right thing. And that's all I can add to anybody here when you talk to ethics. If you stick to your what you believe is right and you stick to that compass, you are, you are doing the right thing depending on obviously your north. But it's, it's about the individual that you're photographing or the situation. That's really uh, moving. Um, Hannah, if I can come to you on the issue of consent. Um, we are working with the news agency, and as we were hearing earlier in the day uh, from Philip and others, that it's a lot about speed mm. when you're working with the news agency. Um, how do you go about uh, securing consent if you do, and uh, where do you seek consent. Some of your photographs will obviously uh, perhaps not show the face, uh, but they could show the person. Mm -hmm. um, what what yardsticks do you use? Um, so um, I completely agree with everything you've just said. Um, on the other side to consent to what Patrick was just talking about is often in situations um, it's not possible to get consent of every, every person that you're photographing. There's a few photographs that um, Jennifer can show. Um, it, yeah, please, there's a couple after the... Um, so the, the first lady that we saw her cry and I was able to spend some time with her and a translator and we heard her story and we sat down and sh and she wanted to tell us about it and she wanted her story heard. Um, but then a few slides in, this kind of situation, these situations here where there's um, mass amounts of people and it's, imp it's impossible to, to get consent off these people, not only um, for my time, but for their time. They've just been given permission to, c to continue crossing into Bangladesh from uh, Bangladesh government in this, in this photo, um, having sat at the riverside for two days and two nights. So for me to stop them in their tracks would have been unfair. Um, so in that kind of situation, it's really difficult to ask for their permission. Um, 
Also, another thing is people make it clear if they don't want to be photographed. So sometimes it's not necessarily asking them if they do, but if they show signs of they don't want to be photographed, then you respect that. You respect the fact that they've, we may not speak the same language, but they've signaled it's, it's a no. Um, there's another situation in a few um, slides down. So this, this young girl was in a children's center. Um, and she struck me by her appearance, and she was a very happy little soul. Um, and so I wanted to find out a little bit more about her story. So I checked with the teachers. It was okay to speak to her, and um, also she had an older sibling with her. So through a translator, we were able to sit down and ask her some questions about the little girl. Um, and then just continuing about not showing people's identity, there's ways around shooting. Um, to illustrate the story, you know, it's not necessarily showing somebody's face. Um, ways like this, and also this. There's two pictures that are very similar here. Um, I was in a hospital waiting area. Um, felt quite uncomfortable about being there because it's not it's the kind of access you get in the UK. There's no way you you would be allowed into a hospital with your camera. Um, and I was in there with uh, this lady who was waiting for her husband to come and see their children that had died in a boat that had collapsed very recently. Um, but there was no indication as that they didn't want me to be there. So I, I stayed and I took some pictures. And I thought to myself, if when the father comes in, they don't want me here and they want some privacy, then I would have left immediately. But they didn't, and so I stayed and I tried to be as sensitive as possible. Um, and the next frame is, I think, it doesn't necessarily show the, the faces of the children that had died, but it, it's a way of uh, illustrating the story without desensitizing it. It's obvious, well, to me, it's obvious that what's going on here. So I just wanted to show two different ways of being able to show how we can illustrate a story with not necessarily identifying people's faces. And also often it's a lot about having a conversation with the editor, so you, you, you shoot pictures. Um, and then the next step is to edit and, and send them to the editors, and then they have a final say of what to do next, whether to, whether to put them on the wire or whether to, um, to not put them on the wire. And so it's important to have that because you're caught up in the moment as a photographer um, taking these pictures and being in that situation, but actually it's their decision as to whether they want the world to see what's what's happening here. And the, the, both of those pictures did go on the wire, but they go on the wire with um, a warning to editors in the caption that there's graphic content in them, which then gives them an, another level of whether they want to use them and what's in the picture. So there's ways around illustrating death and violence and... and sexual harassment victims um, related to consent but uh, another dimension is keeping your the people you photograph safe mm -hmm. and that's of course much trickier um, especially if uh, you're photographing people who are perhaps speaking out against the perpetrators of the violence um, how do you actually achieve that do you never show their face uh, i'm assuming if you're working for a news agency you wouldn't be able to change the name as perhaps uh, matthew can do so how do you deal with the aspect of uh, security um i mean i haven't been put into a situation like that so i don't know if you you have but um th there comes the situation where does the person you're photographing truly understand where where the pictures may end up. We, we often don't know ourselves when, when you put pictures um, on the news wire. So I think, um, personally, I would encourage not to show their identity, just for a safety factor of making sure that it's not going to have repercussions on them. Um, even if you were to say, do you want to be photographed? I think I would prefer to not take that risk for both of us. What about you, Patrick? Uh, Ultimately, it, it's the personal safety. I mean, uh, an image is it's not the it's not worth the risk of somebody's um, 
safety um, and security. It's a, I think you, you, it's all about informing the person that you, informing the person that you're photographing. Um, I think that's the key to it, or is, is to give them as much information as possible. If it comes down to identity, um, there is ways around it, and um, if you could possibly show my last slide, which is an image that um, was used as well. Um, there's simple tricks in, in, in the trade, so to speak, but ultimately it's the, some images that I have taken through my career, which I think are really quite powerful, but they've never been used due to personal safety of the individual. Um, that's my personal choice. I don't think there is a code of ethics. Maybe there is, Eric, I don't know. But ultimately, it's on your head. And if you've got to think like that. If, it's, if something happens to this person, you're the one that's liable. And if you think like that, you will think very cautiously about what you will release to the outside world. And that's, that's the code of ethic I have inside me when it can, deals with those sensitive information or sensitive details. Uh, Menzir, is there something you want to add to this? Because your context may also be a little different that uh, sometimes you are photographing the community within which you live. Uh, one second, the sound sound needs to be turned on. One second, Menzia. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we can hear you now. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It's it's really it can be really uh, sensitive and risky for the person that you are talking to or you know you're photographing. Like, there there have been reported um, few cases where you know because nowadays because you can't go to Northern Rakhine State on your own, the government organized press trips uh, for media and journalists. And um, there, there, there was a couple of few, a few cases where, like, the, somebody who spoke to the journalist in uh, try, trying to give a hint of the reality there uh, got, like, questioned afterwards or even killed. Um, so I think it's really important to, like, you know, because it's, it's, it's a choice for them. Of course, it's a right for them. But also, it's also, you, you know, uh, even better how this could, like, impact. And I, I think it's very important to try and uh, explain uh, it to them. No, you know, not just like, can I take your picture or, you know, can you talk to us? But like, try to explain what could happen um, to the extent as best as you can. And and also like, the, uh, have, I, I, I think I have to think whether it's really, is it really necessary, like, you know, to for the story or like, you know, for, to put somebody at risk because I, I think it's, for me, like, it, it, there's no story that's what risk, risking anybody's, you know, life in, yeah. Well, Matthew, you want to add? Yeah, I, I would just, I would just like to, um, yeah, I, uh, uh, just to add that it, uh, I think also it's important to consider that it's not it's not only about what photos or what information will be um, shared with the outside world or the wider world. It's also about how information is managed internally uh, or as an individual or whatever. So I think it's it's really important, particularly in situations like this with the Rohingya crisis, where you know there there are uh, certain authorities in Myanmar who would absolutely like to do harm to people who are in, engaged in truth telling and so it's uh, it's very important to make sure that any information that could lead to somebody getting in some sort of trouble um, is handled securely there's a whole lot of photos and a whole lot of information that that never sees the light of day that like we as an organization um, you know, we use certain encryption technologies and things like that to make sure that our information is safe. But um, I just wanted to mention that because it's it's uh, um, uh, neglecting that aspect of it. Just the day to day management of information could also lead to some some problems. Uh, we're going to open up the floor in a minute, so do get ready with questions that you might have. Uh, but as a last uh, question from me. Um, we heard in the last panel, Julia was talking about, I think, uh, the competition between, uh, 
you know, to get uh, photographs which one worse than the other. If somebody's photographed a body part, somebody else, a uh, body, somebody else is looking for a body part, uh, that kind of a competition. And uh, what one sees in the public domain is that violence and horrific images seem to trump other kinds of images. And yet in situations of conflict, situations of uh, human deprivation, there are, of course, so many more aspects which are not necessarily extremely brutal, violent, or horrifying. Uh, but if you, as a photographer, may be photographing all those dimensions, what gets picked up, what eventually gets sold or distributed, uh, do you find that it reduces your work as a photographer to more black and white than you would like it to be? Patrick, perhaps? Yeah, um, there's one thing that we haven't talked about, which is an incredibly valid point uh, or angle, is the, the audience. Now, talking about Taiwan and the, the cars, and is, that, is it news? Is it, I mean, it looks to me to be more clickbait than actually clarifying news. It seems to be driven by traffic, the internet, social media traffic. There's something we are not talking about is the education of societies regarding what is news and what isn't news. That is not being talked about. It's always being put on the pretense of the photographer and the deliverer of the, art, uh, the, the media, not actually the person that's consuming it. It's like, well, we didn't, we only build the guns, we don't shoot them type argument in some sense. It, it's just as valid. It's what the audience looks at and reads at drives the market of AFP, Reuters, and all the rest. They, they want this traffic. So I think society needs to take a good hard look at itself and the educational platforms that start from a very young age right up to adolescence and you know, to university. That, I think, is really important. Uh, Minzia, is this something that you'd like to talk about? I think you are now working independently and therefore perhaps the pressure to uh, produce images which are picked up would be even greater than if you're working within an institution? <coughs> One second again, Menzi, the sound needs to be turned on. One second. Yeah. I would also agree in, uh, with the point that Patrick made that, you know, I think it's also really important that the society really needs to be educated uh, in, in following the news as well, because in here in, 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 in Myanmar nowadays, like, you know, although we have in, in internet access, but Facebook actually is the internet here, you know, where like everybody, like what, with, with the popularity of Facebook, we, people stop even like reading newspapers and um, and rather like following whatever is viral on Facebook. So it's really easy to manipulate and also it creates a large um, market for like this sort of clickbait stuff. So I think it's very important to try and give awareness in that sector. Um, yeah, but that's, that's my point as well, yeah. Hannah, um, Matthew, do you want to add anything to it? Um, I think from a photographer's point of view, um, you don't always necessarily know which which pictures are going to be picked up and which pictures are going to have more um, publicity than others. Often you, you will see the worst of the worst being used, but it's important to remember that we cover the whole the whole story. So we is again like Patrick said, often down to the audience, not necessarily. The photographer is not like um, necessarily go looking for just those types of photos, but when they're in front of you, you can't ignore them. I, I think also like it's very important to because you know even though we're photographers, like you know because photographers tend to look for the strongest visual uh, narrative or visual points in what in going to a you know to report on a story. I think, but in doing that, I think it's very important to try and really understand the story and understand the context because after, uh, after I think it's after that we are, we can only 
only then we can accurately like reflect what the context that we understood and try to visualize that. So instead of running around searching for like, you know, the strongest or the most graphic pictures or, you know, it, it, to try to con understand the context and follow uh, the real story, I think it's, it's important to try and do it that way. Uh, on that point of uh, the audience, the importance of it, the limitations of it, I'd like to turn to the audience and invite uh, questions. First here and then here. Uh, so, hi, I'm a student <coughs> studying at uh, City University of Hong Kong. So, I'm interested in journalism. So, that's why I'm here. So, <laughs> My question is, uh, so recently there was an uh, arrest in Myanmar where two journalists were arrested because they uncovered an atrocity by the, uh, like, in the Rohingya crisis. So they, they were journalists from Reuters. So what's your take on that? My question is mainly for Hannah and Minziar. Like, what, basically, what do you think about it? Or, like, your, your opinion? Yeah. Do you want me to go first? Um, so it's important to remember that, that these two journalists were um, reporting on facts. Um, Reuters policy is a stren strenuously impartial way of gathering information, and um, they were unjustly arrested, um, and they should be released from prison. But it press freedom is something that's really important everywhere in the world um, and so it, I think it's important that we raise an awareness of the fact that they were just doing their job and they were just reporting factually on the story and actually now that they're in prison is, is wrongdoing so um, and it could happen anywhere so yeah. Menzer, do you want to add anything to it? Yeah, um, you know, the work that uh, our friends uh, Walon and Joso did was really important. And, you know, and it really br brought here uh, the first ever, like, you know, well, evidence and also, you know, it, it brought to, uh, to the military, like, admitting that, you know, their the, the security forces were, some security forces were involved in that massacre. Um, this is the work they did, but the other thing is that, like ma many people here, like who kind of want them to be like sentenced, uh, they they thought that they were like in prison for this for doing this story. Actually, it's when when the judge actually sentenced them. It's not even that. It's some other uh, like some yeah some other reasons that's not even like strong enough, and and it's I think it was. There was a, you know, it, it really kind of sent a message to other journalists who are trying to do like important stories here, and uh, or, or like critical issues, especially like this sort of this recurring crisis. Uh, to you know, it's it, to to try, so there's a lot. It brought a lot more like self censorship uh, for especially for like young journalists, and also it brought like a lot of concern to the families of the journalists here. So, I, I, and I, but you know the. Despite that, many journalists here are still like supporting and standing with the two, and and also they never in all these court hearings and even on the day they got sentenced, they never showed any 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 weakness or any you know they they they, they stood up really strong. So I'm, I'm really proud about that. Um, but we'll we'll continue to support for their release. Uh, I think what was really heartwarming was how many journalists did come out and stand and publicly demonstrate uh, in support of the Reuters journalists in a, in a pretty difficult situation where being out and protesting could put you at risk. Yeah, uh, so previously, uh, Minzia, you mentioned that when you were in Bangladesh and you were taking pictures, eventually you had to stop because you were on a tourist visa. So. Um, as a photographer, if you're in another country, not necessarily for work, but when you come across situations like this and you take pictures, is that something that you know you can still 
put out or are like visa requirements taken into consideration because like how I, would you get around that yeah i, I think for your uh, i think you, you really have to consider for your own at, at your own expense because you know like whether it, this is really um i mean it, 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 dep it also depends on the issue that you're trying to photograph uh, as well. But I, to be honest, I, I think like these visa regulations are just a matter of a block for people to, you know, to be able to like report freely on issues. Um, so this journalist visa thing should, shouldn't be there, but like, st but still, if you can't, if, if it's, if you have to, in, in, in countries that are uh, quite sensitive and you, you have to apply a journalist visa before doing an, uh, a serious story, then I think you, it's better you try and do that first. Uh, but, you know, I think it, it's also when I went to Bangladesh, I thought, you know, it was a breaking news situation and there were many other journalists who were also on tourist visas. So I thought it was going to be okay. But then what I forgot was I was also, I was coming from Myanmar uh, and which was, which then became, which was always like part of the story. So it was, it was more complicated than usual, I think. I think sometimes uh, if you apply for a journalist visa, you may actually be denied. So I think journalists do go uh, fully and willfully into situations on a tourist visa just to practice journalism, not just because they happen to be there. But uh, of course, you have to be aware of the additional risk because it gives the authorities a very easy way of uh, shutting yeah. you down to say you have violated the terms of your visa. More questions? Um, Hannah, that um, you showed these two images in the hospital and that kind of uh, connected to a few things since the morning to now. Um, one, Philippe had said that uh, one of their uh, colleagues who had died in Afghanistan, um, they were debating about what kind of an image to run and then they decided not to show his face um, when, they, when the picture ran on the wire. Um, and then you mentioned that in UK you would not get permission to be in such a situation and here you know, you're faced with a very different uh, moment. And then you file two pictures and it's up to the editor to decide whether it runs. And then he runs both the pictures. And then now it's up to the person who's publishing to take that call. Um, what do you think? Um, because you seem to lean on a picture that uh, that you showed second, which doesn't show the faces, but the other picture actually runs. What do you think is? Do you think both of them should be on the wire? And why? Uh, if both of them are saying similar things, then um, is the responsibility now on the person that's going to purchase the image? Um, I do think both should be on the wire because um, it, I was honestly telling the story, so it, both situations happened. I saw both with and without the identities of the children. Um, so, which is why I, th I shot them and then thought about them afterwards because I can't go back on that situation. Um, and then I think then it is down to the news outlet if they want to use them, due, maybe for their own audience. Everybody has different um, clients and agendas. Um, for a news picture, there's less sensitivity around what goes on the wire than maybe for s places like yourself when you were saying you would use certain pictures, maybe not showing identities. And um, so then that gives other people who wouldn't necessarily want to show the severity of it with or without. Does that, does, does that answer your question? Sort of. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Sorry, I just want to add a small okay. question while the audience, uh, someone raises their head. And um, when you have uh, victims of sexual violence, women, um, you're working in situations where a lot of the time people may not have birth certificates mm -hmm. or other documents which give their age. And I'm wondering if the issue of whether they are minor or major, how 
that is determined. Patrick, you want to have a try? I mean, uh, you, you so the question is how to determine somebody's age if they don't have proper documentation? Or? I think you would have a different standard of reporting on a victim of sexual violence oh, if the vi victim was a minor, but yeah. you may not always be able to determine that quite easily. So we're we're quite we're we're quite strict. We uh, fortify rights. We we follow a lot of UNICEF's guidelines with respect to um, the rights of children and children being involved in any sort of truth telling or documentation process. But generally speaking, unless there's an overriding um, um, imperative, uh, we wouldn't even interview uh, a child, let alone a child survivor of sexual violence. Um, we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't document that type of testimony again, unless there was some sort of overriding thing, and unless the the the, the child was adamant that they wanted that. Uh, and how, how do you determine the, whether the person is an adult or a child? In a in that a, would necessarily have to come from uh, from from the community itself. Yeah. Um, hi, we have a lot of students here, and obviously. Um, you know, a lot of them aspire to do the kind of works that you guys are doing. What are some words of caution and advice for people approaching this issue? Because, you know, oftentimes students are pitching, we want to do refugees, we want to do sex workers, we want to, you know, approach all these stories. It's for their final project, it's for their portfolio, they want to enter contests. And, you know, they're approaching the, the subject as an assignment. Um, you know, what are some advice that you could give students who want to tackle these hard topics but may not be aware of some of the complicated issues? Do your homework. Really study the subject. Um, make sure that your, your I's are dotted, your T's are crossed. One hole in your, in your, even in your caption can undermine your entire body of work. You need to be, take that really seriously. The context of what the image has been taken in can make or break you if you want to keep this compass in a, a really moral, I don't want to use the word moral, but keep your compass straight. Really don't disrespect your audience. Don't disrespect, obviously, the subject matter that you're photographing. And never, ever photograph for a competition. If you photograph for a competition, please, I would ask you to leave this room. That, don't do that. Sorry, that was maybe a little hard. But Matthew? Yeah, I, I, would, I would actually... Um, depending on the level of experience that a person is bringing into a situation, if it were a situation in which someone had very little experience whatsoever, I would strongly recommend that they not try to sink their teeth into this situation, for example. It's very, very complicated. Um, there's there's so many things that could go wrong. Um, you know, I, we've had even, uh, just recently I was speaking with a, a quite experienced journalist who was talking to us about um, how, um, you know, she went through a, a whole long situation of, of documenting somebody's uh, testimony, which everything was corroborated. But then at the very end, the person couldn't recall certain facts, minor, minor facts, right? Which is a telltale sign of trauma, right? The brain has been affected in such a way that a certain part of the timeline just won't come together. And this is a really experienced person who then just thought that person, everything that person said was a lie. Um, and so these types of things are, are you know, you, you, have, you have to get some experience before going into a, a really complicated situation um, like this. But I think Patrick said it best to just do your homework. And it's always a learning process. Even this, I mean, this morning, today, I'm learning so much from the questions and the dialogue. And so just maintaining that constantly learning is really, really important. Can I just add to that? Don't try and do it by yourself. Um, I've been very, very fortunate to work with some of the most credible human rights work lawyers and journalists uh, alike. And you learn from each other. Um, and my first experience was in a, 
uh, Rayong, uh, it's a small area it's south of um, in the southern tip of Burma. And that was my first real experience of the sex trade and human trafficking and the drug trade. And yeah, we got thrown into the deep end, but what it was was able to have some all these questions that we've been asking ourselves. I constantly ask myself every time I do this, what am I doing it for? Why am I doing it? Who's going to benefit? These are the questions you need to ask yourself constantly. And I do it even now, 20 odd years as a photographer. I constantly question myself if I'm doing the right thing. Especially with somebody like Regima, I was, I really, I cannot tell you how much I had an argument in my own head about letting her be seen. Even though she'd been seen by herself, it was about me doing the right thing by her. I think that's important. Aminzia, would you like to add something uh, to the question on what to advise to give to students? Yeah, um, I, it's, I think, of course, you have to try, like, you have to start somewhere, even though you're not experienced. Or, but, but still, I think it's very important, like uh, Patrick and Matt said, to really try and study and understand the story even before you make the trip. Uh, you know, because I've seen, like, o over the years, like, man, uh, there's, there's some journalists who come, um, you know, don't even know, like, what's the story behind and, you know, and just try... Um, get a fixer and then follow the usual like spots and you know and go back with like some quotes and so but you know and uh, rather than doing that like I think I would re really recommend to try and uh, understand the story even before you cut you make the trip um, yeah and also like it's uh, like Patrick said it's very important to, to uh, it's it's much better to come like to, to not do it alone uh, it's much better when you're assigned or when, when you're doing uh, working on the story with a colleague. Um, like when I got uh, in trouble in Bangladesh last year, I was super like fortunate that I was on assignment for Geo, and because the, the initial suspicion <laughs> was that I was like, uh, I, you know, I, I was spying for the government here, or you know, so if I didn't have valid grounds that I was on assignment doing, you know, on, with, with doing a proper like you know, reporting trip, then. It, it would have been really like deep. I think the issue of community is just so important in the media yeah. and sometimes we as journalists undervalue it because we are in competition with each other. But uh, I think it's becoming more and more important with the new challenges. I mean, um, just going back to what you just said, Patrick, and how do you codify this in an ethics document? I think one thing I, which I refer to quite a lot in the ethics is um, duty of care and minimizing harm. And, and that's just kind of a catch-all, is, is you have that responsibility. And, um, and one thing I introduced in the ethics, and one thing I spoke to a lot of um, photographers, who'd be, particularly photographers who'd been in that situation, and I refer to it in my slideshow, which is coming up actually, is at what point do you put the camera down and I was very interested in your experience and uh, Mr. Rohingya. So, so, I mean, from your experiences, I can open this to everybody. I mean, you're not a first responder. You're a human being. Um, and also, I mean, the one thing I, I say in the ethics is that um, you're involved. You lift a child out of the water, then what do you do? <laughs> What do you do with the child? Do you put it in the ground, or do you hand it to somebody, or what do you do? So, so you, you you've had the experience on the ground, and this is something I'm asked a lot by journalism students. Where do you cross the line? What 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 point do you say I've got to intervene, or, and at what point do you say I loved I'd like to do this, but it's, this is not my job. So so where do you cross the line, or is there a line? A line humanity i think that's the line to start with and then you dial it back from there um yeah okay it's a, it's a it's, i'm going to go off of a tangent but it, it's 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 um it comes back to your point was this is contemplating adopting a child right from a refugee camp and it was obviously a very Western way of perspective of helping somebody. Now, okay, so I'm going to take somebody from a refugee camp. 
I'm going to take them to the first stage, which would be a modern town where there's water that comes out of a facet. How do you explain that, well, number one? And then number two, there's cotton sheets and there's bed and, then, and you don't speak the language. And then you've got to try and explain this. And then you take them in an aeroplane, which is like going into outer space. And then you take them to another city. And, and then this old multiple, you've got to dial it back, right back to the beginning. What, what would you add to that person's life? Okay, so I could possibly open up that person's life to a whole plethora of things. But I could actually cause more damage than good. And that decision cannot, dialing back to your point, that point of humanity, or my example, is this, it's all different at every point. It never is the same. And you just got to stay, I'm going to hate to say it again, but stay true to that compass. Yes, if somebody's dying or somebody's really needs your help, you help them. You can take a picture of them uh, and get them to safety. And, and then you get back to doing your job. But first and utmost, I mean, I couldn't live with myself. I couldn't live myself in America. But if somebody, I was photographing somebody dying, that I knew I could save a life. I mean, you're the ultimately you're the one that's got to live with that. Yeah, I think um, in a lot of situations, your instinct tells you without necessarily a thought process behind it. Often uh, situations happen, and you have, if you've got a bad feeling about it, then it, then there's a reason behind that. And so I think common sense as well. Your safety comes first. There are situations where you do get caught up in in the moment and you you know you want to continue but you th you realize that actually your own safety is m is more important and that's what what you're taught on these hostile environment courses that you know your life's worth more than than harming yourself through taking pictures um, but just what you were saying about helping people there, there were situations that I was in in um, Bangladesh and, you know, you're taught or you're advised not to give your water away, not to give aid away, not to give food away. But as a human, when you've got children around you that are desperate, you, there were occasions where I would. But also, it, you give it to one, you, you can't. How do you decide? So it, I can understand well where they're coming from when they say, you know, don't give your biscuits away because if you've only got three biscuits and 30 children, th that's not fair. So it's about picking your moments as well, about w when to help people and how to help them. Um, there was a few uh, crossings of small rivers um, with bamboo bridges and um, families coming across with babies attached to them and, and belongings, and they were really struggling. And so I thought, well, actually, what, it's more important right now for me to help these people as a human than it is to, as a photographer. So I did help a, a lot of people carrying their children across. I was sort of in the middle of them stepping off the bridge and onto dry land. So I was able to help. But then you look down the line and there's hundreds more and you, you can't stand there all day. You, you, so I think it's about getting the balance right of you feeling like you've helped, but also not inter not intervened too much. Question there, and then there's a second question there. But this room is full of students of journalism, and you don't have questions. <laughs> Come on! I'm sure your teachers India. are rating you on that. Yes, uh, my well, from the things that you've been sharing, there's a lot around you as photographers, um, apart from Matthew who are um, confronted by these people, the Rohingya. To what extent are you going through a medium of another agency, like an NGO or an organization or, you know, I mean, Matthew gave the example of one person sitting there getting all mic'd up and then being asked for consent and the power imbalance in that. And then when I was listening to your story, Patrick, about Regima, I was wondering about whether you had met her through an NGO or an organization. So, and then, you know, Hannah, when you, when you confront these people, it's just, it sounds like it's just you as an individual. And then maybe you send the pictures back, you know, to your institution. But to what extent are we using NGOs, services, institutions on the ground to access 
um, these people and what impact does that have on the process that you, you use in order to photograph and the power of a balance or imbalance. I'm going to say a really nasty word here, but it, it's, it's a real <laughs> balance because you're working for an institution for some ways. It's propaganda. Okay, it's propaganda that the side of the fence that I want to stand on and I believe in and I will, you know, ultimately put my reputation on. And you, you have to be careful with that. And that needle will bend, and, but you really need to be, again, stay to your north. Now, getting back to Regima, I was working with my translator fixer and we were just going around the camp and I was doing this project on the survivors of Tuli Tuli and I was constantly asking, and we need to find as many people as possible. And we just asked and we just asked and we just literally narrowed it down, going, walking through and just stopping people and, and asking. Now, my entire body of work with uh, the Rohingya was done under the umbrella of UNICEF and I have a quite a unique um, agreement with UNICEF. I get my own translator, I have my own driver and I have total freedom. There, there is. They want their pictures of kids being immunized and, you know, getting measured and stuff, which I totally agree. With. Those images need to be done, but they, it also needs authenticity. I need to have ownership of these images, and what I mean by that is not the physicality of the, the monetary response from it or the compensation, but actually knowing that these images are mine and it's my voice, and it's that authenticity of your voice, that narrative that is, is important to me. And that's what I mean by ownership. Now, UNICEF will use those pictures um, to their discretion, and I will use them to my discretion. Um, so to build up your relationship and trust with such organizations as Fortified Rights or Human Rights Watch or Amnesty and, and, and so forth, and also publications. Uh, you know, you, they need the authenticity of your voice as well. It's not just um, an NGO or a, a, a government uh, institution, it's a non-government institution such as uh, UNICEF. But your voice is important. And stick to it. I got a bit sidetracked there, I think. Sorry, I got sidetracked. Thank you for speaking. Um, I guess my question is more broader based on like the historical context of photography, especially with um, trauma situations and um, crisis. How has technology impacted the way photography is used to document each coming crisis? Because there have been them, there have been crises before, and. And we know that there will be a next crisis, you know, 20, 30 years down the line. And unfortunately, each one is different, but the reality is always in some ways very much the same. But I think the underlying difference is the technology that's being used to document that. And I feel like, do you think this um, intersection between technology and photography is changing the moral compass, moral compass of how people define ethics? Um, could you talk about that in, uh, as it pertains to the documentation of this of the Rohingya crisis and how you anticipate um, it might move the needle in the future? Um, that's a full-fledged interview, and I hope you will follow up and do that interview while they're around today. But maybe we should narrow it down to well, is technology changing technology has increased my workload by about 35%. It hasn't decreased it. I uh, just want to clarify that, that uh, the time I used to shoot film, I would bag it, you know, label it, and then I would have meetings uh, and I would talk to people about what was happening in camps or on borders or the situation and gather more information. That doesn't happen now. I'm stuck at my laptop processing images because people think the immediacy is, is important. And I totally agree with the immediacy, but it's not the end game. For me, it's about having the narrative as accurate as possible uh, and dealing and keeping that. So digitized world hasn't, it's, a, it's made things very fluid, 
but it, it, it doesn't mean the storytelling has changed any. It's still the same laws that govern it, in my view. Matthew, you want to address especially the part about the, does it shift the moral compass to be so dependent on technology? Uh, we, I, I mean, I think with, with the increased access to technology, uh, there, there definitely comes more responsibilities. But um, I found myself thinking of conversations we were having with the diplomatic community when, you know, uh, while villages were getting burned down and while, you know, children are being thrown into fires and we're documenting mass rape and killings and massacres, and we're bringing that information to governments, to government officials, and one of the first responses uh, consistently that we got from diplomats was, uh, why is there no video evidence? Um, and it was it was such a jarring moment because you know we had and this been the case that I'm thinking of we had just come from the border where you know there there's there's evidence coming out of the border right but what these what these particular individuals wanted was the act of killing on film and and I actually I had a conversation uh, uh, with um, a, a legal professional in, in the U.S. just sharing my own frustrations and he actually said. Um, if that were, if the threshold, and he was talking from the perspective of American courts, but it would it would maintain anywhere. But he said, if the threshold of holding somebody accountable for murder was that you had to capture the act of killing on video, there wouldn't be a single conviction anywhere, right? Uh, but what what diplomats were bringing to they were what they were projecting onto the situation was, well, I have my iPhone in my pocket, and if I saw something, I would just film it, right? Um, and and uh, so I think there's that aspect of technology where now we're in a situation where, you know, at Fortify Rights, we can receive video that has evidentiary value and we can release it and it can lead to people being held accountable. But the flip side to that is that now certain people in the international community are like, yeah, well, if we don't see it on somebody's iPhone or smartphone, then did it really happen? Um, and, and this has been a really um, agonizing in this particular uh, thing it's been agonizing, but not not I don't mean agonizing for us for Rohingya communities, members of the Rohingya community that are going themselves and and you know we've facilitated some of it and they're going to talk to government officials, and those officials are asking them, well is there video, and meanwhile they're asking that to somebody whose family had family members had been killed or burned out of their homes right so that's a, that's a situation of trauma and there's there are ethical things there. Um, as well, so it's um, uh, and and from the side of being a researcher and documenting human rights violations, there are also ethics to having to ask that question. Um, in this day and age, there is an imperative to ask that question. You know, did anybody film it? It's a terrible thing to have to ask somebody who just survived a massacre, for example. Um, but for the purposes of documenting evidence, so there are many layers to it. I guess is what I'm getting at there. Can I just add to that? Me and Matt were talking earlier on. It was an interesting case. It was a, I'm, I'm not quite 100% clear on my dates, but it was a, either a G8 or a G5 summit in Vancouver, and there was a riot that broke out, and there was a photograph taken over the shoulders of some policemen with riot shielders, and in the background was the rioters. And there was, and turned out to be an Australian guy picking up his girlfriend who had slipped over, and he kissed her. Now, it all came out, it's fake, it was a setup, it, it was all of a setup. It only became factual, it only became real until somebody posted a video of the event from an elevated position from a car, from a car park. So the, the inflation of evidence, which Matt is talking about now, the a photograph is, is not longer viable. You now need to have video evidence. And, and then what's the next stage? You know, it's it's this evolution of technology. Is it causing, it's causing an inflation in 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 uh, evidence, in in my view. Uh, yeah, we're nearly out of time. Minzia, do you want to say something before we close the session? Uh, no, I, I just I was just going to add. Like, I think it's also really a balance where of um, whether you're trying to like provide evidence or you're trying to. Um, or you're trying to provide evidence, or you're trying to like uh, to really communicate at an emotional level. I, I think it it also depends on the purpose and the nature of the story. But regarding technology, like I've realized that 
like for example, in this covering the Rohingya crisis, there's a lot more like drone coverage, or or there's a lot like uh, there's some like virtual reality coverage. Um, but I think it it all comes down to, in my point of view, that you know what what, what the the most important thing is the the story and how uh, how it will be told in you know in the most powerful way, how best we you can tell the story and and try to like use the technology as a tool. I think that would be good. Thanks, Manziar, and I'm really glad the technology in use today has allowed you to be with us throughout the <laughs> session. Um, so I'm going to bring it to a close now. Uh, apologies to the young man. I was trying to give a chance to those who hadn't asked a question, but hopefully you're heading towards journalism and will ask them over tea. Thank you very much to the panelists uh, for a very interesting session.